Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining me for this uh, presentation on the mathematical models uh, for COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so some of these results are in collaboration with uh, my colleagues in China, Professor Meili Li and her graduate students. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Bao Jin Song from Montclair State University in the US. And this research is founded by Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and National Natural Science Foundation of China. So we're going to first look at a few uh, outbreaks of COVID-19 uh, in some places like the BC and China. And we're going to look at how we will use mathematics to describe these outbreaks and what we can get from these mathematical models. And we'll look at how we uh, calibrate our model to describe a specific outbreak. And then we'll look at some of the parameters that we would estimate from other types of data. And then we'll look at what we can conclude from this presentation. Now here is the COVID-19 pandemic in BC. The red dots shows the number of diagnosed cases in each day. And the bluish dots are the number of tests given out on each day. You can see that uh, the two curves are roughly proportional to each other. And you will see that the in the y-axis, the scales are not linear. It's something called a log scale. It means the magnitude increases, uh, not the absolute value. So we start from zero, a one, it jumps to 10, then the next take is 100. In this specific scale, if you see a straight line, then that corresponds to exponential growth. Uh, so you can see at the beginning of the outbreak, the dots sort of line up along a straight line. That means at the beginning, the outbreak is roughly exponential. Here is an outbreak in the epicenter of China, the Hubei province. The red dots are the number of diagnosed cases in each day, and the blue dots are a sample of the real epidemic. They are the patients who are infected in Hubei, but they left Hubei and hospitalized in other provinces. And the number uh, represents the number of patients showing a symptom on a specific day. Then you can see that, um, again, in this log scale, the blue dots at the beginning of the outbreak sort of line up along a straight line, which also shows the exponential growth. And the red dots also line up roughly on the a straight line at the beginning, uh, but with a larger slope, which suggests that uh, the exponential in diagnosed cases seem to grow faster, which may be an artifact of underreporting at the beginning of the epidemic. And maybe uh, when more diagnoses are, are the diagnose capacity increases when more diagnoses come up later. So we may see an artifact in the increased exponential growth. Uh, the curve in the blue dots were patients hospitalized in other provinces uh, has a turn around March, uh, sorry, the January 23rd. And that's the lockdown of the Wuhan city, the epicenter in China. So this lockdown prevented people leaving Wuhan and Hubei, so uh, there are fewer and fewer people uh, showing symptoms outside of Hubei. So what we know about COVID-19, um, first of all, it's a viral infection. It's caused by a SARS-like virus. Uh, like most viral infections, people will get infected, they will wait for a few days before they show symptom and starts to transmit. Then they transmit for a while and then they recover. Once they recover, they will have immunity. And it has been shown by 
for example, by the recent Korean CDC data, that people show uh, very strong immunity after recovery, even though they can still show positive, uh, but they will not be transmissible to other persons. Uh, and we know that patients can transmit the disease asymptomatically. It's, uh, for example, shown by Aaron et al. in their 2020 paper uh, studying the nurses in Washington State. And we know the disease has a long incubation period, about 50% of the people show symptoms after uh, six days, and about 97.3 people show symptom after 14 days. Remember the current, the recommended uh, quarantine period is about 14 days. So there are, there may be some people showing symptom after their quarantine. And uh, everywhere in the world, there are currently less than 1% of the population infected. Uh, so overall in the population, the level uh, of immune, immunity uh, is low. So we don't really have herd immunity. So the current slowdown that we observed in all places are due to social distancing. So, we're going to look at how we use mathematics to incorporate these characteristics of COVID-19 and uh, maybe we can use a developer model and use the model to do predictions on what's going to happen. So what are mathematical models? Uh, a model is a representation of a real system. For example, we have seen model car, it's not a real car, but it represents a car. A doll house is not a house, but it represents a house. A mannequin, for example, is not a body, but we use it to represent a body for clothing. So mathematical models are the same thing. We use mathematics to represent a real system. We have uh, seen some mathematical models before. For example, uh, some of you may know there's Newton's second law of motion. It says the acceleration of an object is equal to the force acting on the object divided by the math, mass of the object. And we can, uh, we know if we have an object at hand and uh, release it, that it free fall, and then we can describe the position of the object as a function of time using the so-called free fall um, formula. So the position x is a quadratic function of time t. Uh, these are mathematical relationships uh, that describe a system, a motion of an object for these two examples, but we can use mathematics to describe other things. The key for a mathematical model or that we make simplifications. For example, for Newton's second law of motion, uh, we know it's a very precise prescription, uh, description of the motion, but it's not, uh, we can make it more precise by using the relativity. Uh, for the free falling object, we have ignored a lot of things. We didn't consider wind, we didn't consider the perturbation from other like the moon or the sun, we really just considered the, the most important cases. So we ignored a lot of minor factors that may change the motion. So that's a simplification we make. Um, for a mathematical model, there are a few important quantity, uh, the factors that we need to consider. One is what quantities we're interested in. For the Newton's law of motion, we need to know the acceleration, the force, and the mass. Uh, for um, the free falling object, we need to know the position and time. So these are the quantities, but we also need some parameters. Like for the free falling object, we need to know the initial velocity and the initial position. If we change these parameters, the movement is gonna be different. And at the end, the mathematics uh, is represented in the formulation or the formula or the equations that links these quantities and parameters together. 
So how do we use mathematics to describe the uh, spread of COVID-19 in the population? We're mostly interested in how many people got sick on each day and how many people are transmitting the disease. Uh, so we look at the total population, we divide the total population into a few classes of individuals according to their transmission status. If there are individuals who are susceptible, we call it this class S. Uh, individuals who are infectious, we call them I, and individuals who are removed from the transmission, and we call it R. Being removed could mean uh, a patient recovers, and so the gain immunity will not transmit again, or the individual could be dead, unfortunately, or uh, they could be hospitalized and isolated and does not participate in the transmission anymore. Uh, so then we can look at how the number of individuals in each class change. So for example, the susceptible individuals would get infected upon contact with an infectious individual, and then they become infected and infectious, and they would leave the S class and enter the infectious class. The infectious individuals, after a while, they would recover, uh, for example, or unfortunately they may die, and then they are removed and they enter, they leave the infectious class and enter the removed class. So then we need to know how fast these quantities change. And so how many people are infected on each day and how many people recover on each day. For uh, number of infections on each day, we will assume that each infectious individual would make contact at a certain rate A on each day. And these contacts may be to uh, a susceptible in individual that causes infection or to infectious or recovered individuals and they would not cause infection. So we will need to multiply with the probability that a contact is susceptible. So if we assume that the individuals are ran randomly bumping into each other, then the probability that a contact is susceptible is just a fraction of, of the population who are susceptible. So then we get this formula, the contact rate A times the number of infectious individual I times the probability that a contact is susceptible S over N. And similarly, we can describe how many people recover on each day. And we'll just assume that each infectious individuals recover with a probability, a constant probability T, a B on each day. So on average, the number of recoveries is B times I for a day. And if we put them together, so why would the susceptible individuals change? Um, and what is the change? The change is the number of susceptibles today minus the number of susceptibles yesterday. The difference is the rate of change. And the change is caused by the number of new infections. And the number of new infections take susceptible individuals away. So we will have a negative sign to describe that the susceptible individuals decrease um, by the new infection. And the number of infectious individuals would change because these infections would enter. So the same term would show a positive term, sign and the term corresponds to A times I times S over N as we know, but then recovery takes the infectious individual away. So we will have a minus uh, time, uh, times the number of recoveries, B times I. And these recovered individuals would enter the R and cause the removed individuals to increase. So this is the so-called susceptible infectious removed model, or sometimes we call it SIR model. And it give us a interesting uh, characteristic shape of the outbreak that the population would increase, it reaches a peak, then it decreases. And some of the parameters, we can give it a meaning. For example, uh, what does the uh, rate of recovery mean? Or how is it related to easier, easily observed quantities for disease? Uh, if we look at a patient who are infected on a specific day T, and we want to know what is the probability that he remains infectious one, for one day. That probability is B. Uh, 
what's the probability that he remains infectious for two days? That means he hasn't recovered on the first day, but he recovered at the end of the second day. So the probability would be not uh, recovered. It's one minus B on one day times the recovery on the second day B. So similarly, if the individual remains infectious for K days, then the probability is one minus B to the power K minus one, meaning that he hasn't recovered in the first K minus one days, but he recovered on the last day and with a probability B. So if we put all these together and compute the average, then um, you get one over B, which is the average period that this individual remains infectious. We call it the infectious period. And from the data, we have seen that the number of cases would grow exponentially. Why is that? If we look at, at the beginning of the epidemic, when almost no one, uh, or the, only a fra tiny fraction of the population is infected, uh, so almost everyone remains susceptible. So then the susceptible population is roughly the same as the total population. Then in the transmission term, we have S over I, which is the probability of contacting a susceptible individual. That probability is roughly one. So we can simplify this model. So then our I equation, the infection just got number of new infections per day is simplified to A times I. So then we can look at this equation and rearrange the term. You see the number of infectious individuals in the next day is uh, just a constant one plus A minus B times the number of infectious individuals today. And so if you let the time T to be zero, which means the initial uh, outbreak, then um, for the next day, your T equals one, you can compute the number of infectious individuals in day one, which is one plus A minus B times the number of infectious individuals on day zero. And so you can keep doing that, and you see that the number of infectious individuals on day T grows exponentially, it's one plus A minus B to a power T. And as the time T goes on, the number would grow exponentially. Um, so, if A minus B is positive, that means transmission happens faster than recovery, then the I of T, the number of infectious individuals on day T would grow exponentially. If recovery is faster than transmission, then the I of T would decay exponentially to zero, where the outbreak would die off. So the key quantity is whether the transmission A is faster or larger than the recovery B. So in other words, whether A over B is greater than one. This is a very interesting quantity. We can rearrange this A over B as A times one over B. And A is the transmission rate or how fast, how many people are infected on each day by an infectious individual. One over B is how long this infectious individuals remain infectious on average. So this product tells you how many secondary infections that this patient causes during his time of infection, if all of his contacts are susceptible. So if this number is greater than one, then transmission is faster than recovery, the disease would take off exponentially. If this number is less than one, then recovery is faster than infection, then the disease would die off exponentially. So this ratio, we call it reproduction number or basic reproduction number. So this is the key quantity that controls the outbreak. For example, if the basic reproduction number is two, that means on average a patient infects two other individuals. So we start with one patient, he would infect two, each one would infect two. So in the first generation we have one, in the second we would have two, in the third we would have four, and so on. So the number of infectious individuals will grow exponentially. If, however, the basic reproduction number is 0.5, which is less than one, how we can get 0.5? For example, half of the patient infect one, other patients, another half of the patients do not make any uh, infections. 
So then, for example, we would start with four, and then half of them would transmit, uh, half of them would not transmit. So in the next generation, we get two. And then in the next generation, um, one would transmit, the other wouldn't, we would get one. And so the disease would die off. So this is the case at the beginning of the outbreak when everyone is still susceptible. But if the disease goes on, or if we vaccinate a lot of people, so that a lot of people have gained immunity, either from previous infections or from vaccination, then not all the contacts of the infectious individuals are susceptible anymore. So suppose the fraction P of the population is immune, either from immune, uh, previous infection or vaccination, then the number of secondary transmissions that an infectious individual can make is really the basic reproduction number R0 times one minus P. So to control a disease, we need this product R0 times one minus P to be less than one. So the average infection uh, is less than one. So this corresponds to a critical fraction of uh, vaccination or immunity. This fraction P have to be greater than one minus one over the basic reproduction number R naught. So if a fraction P has been vaccinated, then we know the disease would die off exponentially. So for example, if R naught is two, on average one infectious individual infect two others, then the corresponding critical vaccination uh, fraction is a half. We need to vaccinate at least half of the population to control the disease. If R0 equals 1.5, then the critical uh, fraction to be vaccinated is one third. That means we don't need to vaccinate everyone from the population. We really just need to reduce the number of secondary infections to be below one. And this is what the herd immunity means. And that's the key concept to control an outbreak. But for COVID-19, uh, patients, when they get infected, they do not immediately become infectious. There is a period, quite a latent period, where the disease would develop in their body, but the patient is not infected. So how can we incorporate this concept? Well, we'll just add a new class exposed class into the model where the individuals, once they are infected, they enter the so-called exposed class. Uh, virus would develop in their body. They remain not uh, infectious for a period of time. Then they become infectious and they enter the I class. So this E class change because new infections come in at a rate A times T, I T uh, minus the rate that people show symptom. And we assume each exposed individual shows symptom with the probability C on each day. So we get a new equation in the model. And um, if you have taken linear algebra or matrix algebra in a college or university, you know that this expression this model can be expressed into a matrix form and you see it's like a number uh, growing to a power t. Uh, this is a matrix growing to a power t. But the result is similar that the number of exposed or not infectious but infected and infectious individuals i would grow asymptotically exponentially or in the long run, the whole curve grows exponentially with the rate r, where r is the dominant eigenvalue, if you know what I mean. But if you don't know matrices and eigenvalues, it's fine. It still tells you that the curve would grow exponentially. And it turns out that whether the curve grows or decays exponentially still depend on the same number, the basic reproduction number or not. And it's the same meaning whether the infection is faster than recovery or slower than recovery. Another factor that we need to consider is social distancing. And social distancing reduces contacts. So it makes the transmission rate A smaller. Um, so here is a figure showing the Google mobility data. It shows the percentage reduction in different types of activities like residential 
uh, contact uh, movement or uh, grocery shopping, uh, public transit stations, workplaces, etc. You see that the uh, activity dies down slowly until it reaches a minimum. So how do we model that? We'll just assume that our contact remains constant at a maximum before the social distancing is implemented. In BC, the social distancing is implemented on March the 15th. Uh, after that, uh, we assume that the contact rate A decays linearly for about nine days, then it reaches a minimum, and we call the maximum A1 and the minimum A2 and a linear curve in between. That's how we can describe the transmission rate A, how that changes with the time caused by social distance. Another, so if we put all these things together, we can uh, modify our model into a fuller, uh, more complete mathematical model to describe the number of patients, uh, how the number of patients changes with time for COVID-19. Another factor that we can consider is asymptomatic transmission. In, individuals may transmit before they show major symptoms like fever. Um, so we add a new asymptomatic transmission class. Uh, in, each individual in the asymptomatic transmission class would start to show symptom with probability S on each day. And the patient, when they leave the exposed class, they would first enter the asymptomatic class and after a while they would enter the symptomatic transmission class. Also, we need to consider diagnosis because not all patients are observable. Only those who are tested positive, we would call them COVID-19 patients. So we would look at these patients are, must show symptoms. Most likely they would show symptoms. That's how we catch them. And we assume that the individuals in the transmission, the infectious class I, get diagnosed with a probability D on each day. So then we put all these things together, we get a uh, more complete COVID-19 model, which we can match this model to data and describe specific outbreaks. Uh, but how we use this model? How do we use this model to make predictions? We need two things. One is, the initial condition, the initial number of exposed asymptomatic transmitting, symptomatic transmitting, and diagnosed cases. And a second is the parameters like the transmission rate A, the recovery probability B, the um, probability patients showing symptom C, uh, are becoming infectious, showing symptom and diagnosed. So if with these informations, then we can start with our initial condition. We use our model, we set T equals one, we'll get the number of people in each class on day one. Then we use the information for T equals one, which is computed. Then we put again into the model, look at T equals two, we get the number of infectious uh, individuals, et cetera, on day two. So we can keep doing that and if, you are familiar with computing or programming, you know that it's really straightforward to start with our model and change it into a computer program to compute all the future number of infectious individuals on each day. So this is a basic idea of how we use these mathematical models. And keep, the key is to model the number of changes on each day in each group of population. So this rate of change, if you know calculus, you know that the rate of change is typically modeled by derivatives. We are just using a difference as an approximation to the derivative. So if you know derivatives, you can set up an equation that involves the derivatives and you get a differential equation. And that's what you would learn in um, a, a university differential equation course. Uh, but it doesn't matter what type of equations you use to describe the rate of change, the basic mathematical ideas are the same. 
So now we'll look at how we can estimate these parameters so that our model can describe a specific outbreak in a place. So we'll need to match our model to data. So what kind of data we have? We can have daily uh, diagnosed data, number of patients were tested positive on each day. What does that number correspond to? It turns out it corresponds to the uh, detection rate D times I. Uh, another type of data is the number of people showing symptom on each day, and we that corresponds to um, the S times the number of asymptomatic transmissions, S times A. So on each day, we can uh, match the D times I term and S times A term to the two types of data we have, and we can use uh, we use a Bayesian approach, which is called a Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, if you don't know this method, it doesn't matter. I don't want to go into too much details of this. I just want to say that this is a standard statistical method that people have developed and uh, used for a long time. The key is we're going to use this method to estimate the parameters in this model, the transmission rate, recovery rate, et cetera, et cetera, and the initial conditions. So for example, this is the outbreak in Wuhan, and this is not the number of patients in Wuhan, this is the number of patients who left Wuhan and got hospitalized in other provinces. And because in China, the uh, social distancing and contact tracing is so strong in other places than Wuhan and Hubei, uh, that uh, this data is very um, trustworthy. So we fit our model, the, the number of people showing symptom uh, to this curve, using the uh, statistical method, then we can get our parameter values. It turns out that not only one parameter value can describe this, a range of parameter values can give us very similar shapes. And these range of parameter values are given as a distribution. As you can see, we can roughly estimate the basic reproduction number uh, for Wuhan. It's pretty high. It's about four, uh, actually three point something, and with a pretty wide uh, range. And you can see that after January the 23rd, the lockdown, the transmission is really low. Uh, it's 0.1 on average, but this, this doesn't mean that the transmission is low because these patients are caught in other provinces. That means that um, uh, there are very few people leaving Wuhan after the January 23rd. Uh, we have a rough estimate about the incubation period, is, which is roughly uh, 5.3 days, but we can't really estimate the infectious period or how long a patient keeps infecting. As you can see, the distribution is very flat or a big range of values are possible. So it means we can match our model to the data reasonably well with some parameters estimable, some parameters like the infectious period, we can't determine from this data. If you look at the outbreaks in BC, it gives us more challenges, mostly because we, the curve is about how many people are diagnosed or tested positive on each day. We don't know how many people show symptom on each day. And this data is collected, but it's not made public yet. Uh, so we and my colleagues at UVic and uh, Island Health are applying for access to more detailed data so that we can analyze the BC outbreaks in more details. But for the parameters that we can't directly estimate from the curves, uh, we may estimate from other sources. For example, we'll look at the uh, published Chinese case description data. And here are some uh, two specific examples of these case de descriptions published by Chinese provinces. Uh, the case 34 in Tianjin, uh, it's a city in, in China, is a female with some age 
lives in a certain district of Tianjin. Is, she is a sales representative at some uh, shopping center. One of her colleagues uh, visited Beijing and contacted a patient with high fever in Beijing, and the colleague showed symptom on January 25th. So it's likely that the case 34 uh, got contacted, infected by his, her colleague, and her colleague is diagnosed as case 37 in Tianjin. And this case 34 showed symptom on January 27th and diagnosed on the same day. So it's very detailed information. It tells us a lot of things about the outbreaks in China. And it's made publicly available for almost all provinces except Hubei. We tabulated 3,547 cases uh, by April the 4th. And among these 2,747 cases have the date of symptom onset. And 646 cases have both the date of symptom onset and the date of being infected. So this period in between is called the incubation period. So we can use this 646 cases to estimate the distribution of the incubation period of these patients. We can also look at who contacted who. Um, and it turns out of all these records, we are sure that 20 of the patients infected others before they showed major symptoms. Only five were sure that they infected others after they show major symptoms. So it seems asymptomatic transmission may be an important factor in the outbreaks. So here are the incubation periods that we observed that we can pinpoint to a specific day. And some inf incubation periods are uh, given as a ranges. So it could be one to three days, five to seven days, for example, that we, it's not easy for us to plot it. We only plot the incubation period that can pinpoint it to a specific uh, duration. Then we can fit this data to a specific distribution. And then we can estimate the mean incubation period for the, our best estimate is about 7.1 days. So on average, patients show symptom after 7.1 days. The median, which means 50% uh, of the individuals show symptom uh, on or before 6.2 days. And of course, 50% of the patients show symptom after 6.2 days. And then 95% of the patients show symptom between 1.2 days and 17.3 days. It specifically, it turns out that 7.3% of the patient would have an incubation period greater than the 14-day uh, recommended quarantine period, which is uh, a little bit dangerous because it means it's likely that people would show symptom after the exit quarantine. And others would think that they are fine because they exited the current period and should be safe. So here's a quantile of the incubation period. It shows you what fraction of the people would have an incubation period longer than 14 days, 15 days, etc. But it turns out these 7.3% of the population having incubation period than 14 days does not mean that all of the 7.3% percent of the, the patient would fail in incubation, uh, uh, quarantine, because the patient could be quarantined at any stage in the incubation period. Uh, the patient could be uh, quarantined near the end. So the 14 day period time, but plus the, uh, the incubation period before the quarantine uh, is the real incubation period. So, um, so it's less likely than 7.3% for a patient to fail quarantine. And if we have computed, uh, we don't want to show here the details, but if the epidemic curve is flat, this corresponds to 3% quarantine failure. But that's still a lot if we quarantine a lot of patients. And that would give us asymptomatic transmissions in the population where people would believe that these patients are safe because they exited quarantine. So we must be cautious for those who exited quarantine and 
have keep in mind that there's a small chance that these patients can still infect others. So that's all the results I want to present today. In summary, we looked at how we establish mathematical models. And we can use these mathematical models for, uh, to predict what happens in COVID-19. We can estimate the key quantities for COVID-19. And we can use it, for example, to look at how effective the control measures are, uh, what are the best testing strategies if we include testing schemes in our model. So the mathematical models are important, mostly just because we can't really do experiments in the population. So how can we study them? Mathematical models give us an important tool to quantify uh, what happens uh, for the COVID-19 outbreak. So we know the basic reproduction number can be estimated uh, from the case reports. Different places would have different basic reproduction numbers uh, based on uh, control measures and uh, people's in patients' behavior. We can estimate incubation period from the case description data. Uh, we know that 50% of the patient have incubation period greater than six days. 17.3% uh, of the patient would have incubation period longer than 14 day quarantine period. Uh, the incubation, the latent period and infectious period are actually not uh, directly observable from case description data. We cannot easily estimated from the case counts data that's published. Uh, so we are looking at more sophisticated methods to estimate these parameters because they are key to uh, model predictions. And that's all I want to present today. Thanks for listening. Bye.